All right, good morning. This is our first lecture before first contact. And what we're going to talk about in this lecture is the three groups of people that come together to make the society we live in today. And that's the Native Americans, that is uh, Europeans, and that is West Africans as well. Because without those three groups, I don't think you really have the United States we live in today. So I'm going to start with the indigenous people, the Native Americans. And the Native Americans have been here for a really long time. Um, the first time that we have real hard evidence of people coming to, and living in North and South America, it's about 10 to 15,000 years ago. And once upon a time, when the world was colder, there was an ice age. And with the ice age, the sea level was much lower than it is today. And so you could walk from, from Russia to Alaska. And you could do that for thousands of years. And so people came and they went and they didn't realize that they were entering a different place. Well, eventually the earth started to warm up and the glaciers started to melt and the sea levels rose. And so those people who were in North America, they couldn't get back home and they just stayed here. Now, what made the people move back and forth was food. Um, it was a time when you couldn't go to a, a grocery store, you couldn't just go to a gas station. You had to actually hunt and gather and find everything that you ate. And these hunter-gatherers, uh, they're going to follow their food. And as their food, their food moved back and forth between Russia and Alaska and North America, you know, they followed it. Well, when the water rose and they couldn't get back home, they had to make a living of it here. And so populations became established throughout North America, eventually Central America and South America over, you know, a period of about 5,000 years or so. Um, Agriculture is not something that people did at this early age. Uh, everything that you ate, you had to either gather or you had to find or you had to hunt. Agriculture and the idea of farming, it's about 7,000 years ago. And if you look at how long human history is, that's basically like yesterday. So agriculture, we take it for granted in many ways, but it's really a new thing. And primarily, people hunted and gathered up till about 1,000 A.D., which was, you know, what, 1,023 years ago. Um, besides this land bridge, as it was known, the Bering Land Bridge, it's underneath the Bering Sea today, um, there's a secondary way that we're pretty certain people came to South America, and that is by boat. Um, some scientists a couple years ago they came up with this hypothesis that canoes could sail across Pacific Ocean because when they started doing DNA analysis, they found out that some of the people in Central and South America, their DNA matches with people from Pacific Islands. And so they actually took some trees, cut them in half, and made canoes out of these trees and were able to get from these small Pacific Islands to the coast of Western South America. And so now we think that's a completely and totally legitimate way that people came to the Americas in addition to walking from Russia to Alaska. Now, the people who are going to be established in North America, they are going to develop these complex civilizations. One of the groups, and I have them on this slide here, are the Anasazi. Uh, they're going to live in what is today New Mexico and Arizona. And they're going to be some of the first people in the Americas to grow cotton. They're going to grow some, some sort of corn, maize, as it was known then. Uh, the Anasazi are going to build roads and canals, and they're going to know how to do agriculture and irrigation. And the Anasazi are really interesting because they actually built some of their homes in the side of cliffs. There is one particular cliff in New Mexico, it's called Chaco Canyon, and that's Chaco like the shoes. And 
they dug homes into the side of these canyons. And the only way to get into the homes, because they're on the sides of these canyons, was to use ladders. And if you don't want somebody to come into your house, then all you do is pull up the ladder and they can't get in. And Chaco Canyon, New Mexico is today like a national heritage site that you can go to and you can visit. Um, another group of Native Americans, this is going to be the group that we're familiar with, the Mississippians. And they're called the Mississippians because they live along the Mississippi River Valley and they also lived here in the Southeast. So the Creek, the Cherokee, the Choctaw, the Seminole, all of these groups of people that we're somewhat familiar with here in the Southeast, they were once part of this Mississippian culture. Uh, the Mississippians, they're going to be the ones who hunted with bows and arrows. They're going to be the ones who did a lot of foraging and built like Indian mounds here in Georgia. Um, they did not live in teepees, though. Uh, teepees, a lot of people think of that when it comes to Native Americans. That was mostly the people who lived in the Great Plains. Here in the southeast, they lived in something known as a longhouse, which was a house that was long, and it was made with sticks and mud and things like that. Um, some of the cities of these Mississippians were huge. Uh, the city of Etowah, or that's near Char Cartersville today, that we know as Etowah today, it had at as big as something like 10,000 people. And the Etowah Indian Mounds, that is the most complete site for the Mississippian culture available in the Southeast. And it is a Georgia State Park today, and you can go visit it. Uh, way down in South Georgia, south of Albany, almost to the Florida state line, are the Kolomoke Mounds. And that is the oldest Mississippian site in the Southeast. And that was a village that was active from basically 300 to 600 AD. Uh, that's also a state park you can go and visit, and um, I've been there, and it's pretty interesting. The largest of the Mississippian sites is known as Ancient Cahokia, and that's near St. Louis. If you ever go to St. Louis, um, the site of Cahokia is on the Illinois side of the river, uh, basically where East St. Louis is today. And we have evidence that the city of Cahokia had over 40,000 people. Uh, it may have even been bigger than that. And Cahokia had um, temples, it had mounds. We have excavated a couple of the burial sites and found signs of human sacrifice. We know that the people of Cahokia, uh, they were familiar with astronomy and astrology. They had a, a version of Stonehenge that we call today Woodhenge. And they also had a huge wall around the city that was probably to protect them. Now, the city of Cahokia, no European ever talked to the people that lived there. The people who lived in Cahokia that whole city came and went before Christopher Columbus, and we don't know what happened to them. We don't know what happened to the city. We have a couple of different theories, but we don't know for sure what happened. Um, now, Native American culture, there are many, many different culture groups out there, but they all kind of have some similarities. and. One of the biggest similarities that all these Native American groups have is the idea of kinship. Uh, most Native American towns or villages or whatever you want to call them, they were families that were related to each other that grew. Now, they could be blood related or they could be like um, marriage related, but they're all related in some way and they form this kinship group. And these kinship groups are where the people get their beliefs. It's where their, their way of life is going to be forged, where their, their religion is going to be developed, and all their customs, all their laws, all of their expectations are going to be formed in these kinship groups. Another thing that's pretty similar throughout all these Native American cultures is the idea that the workload is shared. 
Uh, men and women are equally important in these Native American cultures. Uh, depending where they are, men may do a little bit more than women or the jobs are going to be different. But Native American culture, it revolves on the idea that the gender roles are equal. Uh, women are going to be in charge of raising the families and maintaining the household. Uh, the men are going to be in charge of uh, diplomacy and hunting. Uh, both men and women are going to be needed to keep the community together. And then when it comes to religion, men will mostly be in charge of religion, but women have very high participation rates. Um, the last thing that kind of binds these Native American cultures together is just the way the religion works. While each Native American religion may have slightly different beliefs or different ideas, they almost uh, consistently across the board have some sort of creator or creation story. There are going to be prayer rituals where they pray to their ancestors or their elders or their God. And there's the belief of an afterlife. And very often when a Native American passed away, they were said to be going to the West. And for me, as somebody who has studied some American, Native American culture, the most interesting thing to me is this idea of the trickster myth. Uh, the trickster was this being who was kind of aloof or, or um, inquisitive, almost childlike. And the trickster's job was to teach the children various lessons. Uh, one example that I know of comes from the Ojibwa or the Winnebago culture. And in that culture, their trickster wants to fly. And so the trickster makes friends with all the birds and takes feathers from them and puts together a suit of feathers so that the trickster can fly. Well, a trickster flies, jumps off a cliff and tries to fly and flaps his wings and crashes into somebody's house. And the idea there is um, the Ojibwa are teaching their children just to be themselves and be who they are and not to be somebody they're not. The second big group of people that come together to make our society are Europeans. And honestly, I'm not going to go too far into this because European history is what you've been learning since you were in kindergarten. Uh, so you probably already know about kings and lords and queens and you might have an idea of peasants and commoners. Uh, so I'm not going to go too far into that. Um, Europe at the time that exploration is happening is an agricultural lifestyle. Most of the people are going to live in the farms and in small towns. And if you were to ask me to name a large city in Europe, my list is very small. It's basically Rome, Paris, London, Brussels, maybe Berlin in, in uh, what is today Germany. But most towns in Europe are very small, just a thousand people at the most. Um, where kinship groups remain really, really strong in Native American culture, when it comes to European life, the kinship groups, they're not that important. Uh, it's the immediate family that's important, what we call a nuclear family. And it's mom, dad, and the kids that are really going to just live by themselves. Um, in European culture, religion is very important. Christianity, uh, I have here, it's the cultural glue that keeps Europe together. Uh, something that a lot of people don't realize or don't understand is that religion was a lot stronger back in the 1400s than it is today. The Catholic Church, which was the only game in town, wasn't just a religion. It was a way of life, and it was a government, too. When we get into the early 1500s, the Catholic Church is going to split. The Reformation is going to happen, and suddenly there's a couple different flavors of Christianity that are going to be circulating through Europe. And so Christianity is still important, but it does go through some changes at the same time that exploration is happening. And speaking of exploration, uh, the age of exploration, the idea of people coming and looking at the new world, a lot of that has to do with the Renaissance. During the Renaissance, people, they decide, 
well, I want to explore. I want to see what's on the other side of the ocean. I want to see what happens if I build this boat, or I want to see what happens if I make this, this statue out of marble. So the Renaissance, it's a period of questions, and those questions lead to people saying, I wonder what's over there. I wonder what happens if I get on this boat and just go sail and find something. The last group are West Africans. And just like Native American culture, there's many different cultural groups. That's true for West Africans. Uh, at one point in time, there were thousands of different cultures that stretched from what is today Senegal to Angola, basically the western bend of Africa. Uh, even though the Native Americans and the West Africans have very different origins, they have a lot of similarities. Uh, kinship groups are really important in West African society. Um, just like in Native American kinship groups, you have a family, that family grows either through births or marriages, and before you know it, this family forms a village, the village gets bigger, they form a nation, and that's kind of how that works. Uh, the kinship groups are also going to be where you get your way of life, your beliefs, your customs, you name it. Just like Native Americans, um, hunting and gathering maintains a huge, important piece of feeding the people of West Africa. You do get small-scale farming. You get the growing of things like yams, and I think sorghum is what it is. But for the most part, farming is on a small scale in West Africa. Uh, there is some raising of domesticated animals, uh, chickens and cows, things like that. And then gender roles, they are going to be shared just like in Native American culture. Uh, women farm, women maintain the household, the men are going to do the hunting, the diplomacy, things like that. One big difference between West African culture and our culture today is that in traditional West African culture, uh, families match with lineal, meaning that all things descend through the mother's side. It's like when a man and a wife got married, the man would move into the wife's family or become a member of the wife's family. And very often today, that's the opposite of what you get from the European style. Uh, hereditary is traced through the mother, where today, more often than not, our heredita her heredity is traced through the father's side of the family. Uh, very often, you know, if you you take the father's last name, things like that. Well, that's not how it happened in West Africa. All, all hereditary is traced through the mother. Uh, these villages are going to be ruled by a noble or a priest or somebody usually known as a big man. And the big man is going to be whoever can cobble together the most wealth and the most influence in that village or in that town. And instead of your own son, if you're the big man, being the one who's going to take over after you, it was the son of your sister who would be the next to take over. In West African, there is a native religion. It's called animism. Uh, but it is going to be very much replaced or mixed with other religions. Uh, Islam, in particular, is going to mix with, or in many cases, replace native West African religion. As something you may be more familiar with is the idea of voodoo. Uh, voodoo is actually a native West African religion mixed with Christianity, as is a Brazilian religion known as condomblé. So these native African religions are going to mix with other religions to create something new. All right, so that is the short view of what's going on before, before colonization and, and um, just kind of how these three separate cultures are going to shape up. And uh, that's it for this lecture.